Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra, the video course where we talk about matrices, vector spaces, vectors and so on. And now in today's part 37, we continue talking about how to solve a system of linear equations. In particular, we will discuss what row operations are. Indeed, row operations is what we need to formulate the Gaussian elimination. Okay, but before we start with that, you already know, first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And each supporter of the channel gets a bonus in the form of a PDF version and a quiz for the video. Okay, then let's start the topic of today by recalling what we want to solve. Namely, we have a system of linear equations we can write as a times x is equal to b. And we have learned in the last video that all the information of the system is given in the augmented matrix AB. Hence, manipulating linear equations always translates in manipulating a matrix. And exactly that's what we do today when we talk about row operations. So the overall idea here is that we change the system to a simpler form such that we can find the solution set. However, this requires that we don't lose any information while doing the manipulation steps. So for example, on the matrix level on the left, this would mean that we change the matrix A to another matrix A tilde. And now what we want is that this change, this operation is reversible. Hence, this whole operation here should be described by an invertible matrix. In other words, M times A should be equal to our A tilde. And then M should be a square matrix, which is invertible. Because then we can just multiply A tilde with the inverse of M to get our A back. So more precisely, A is equal M inverse A tilde. Now I can already tell you, usually we will not do this reverse operation. However, it's important to note that it is theoretically possible because it means we don't lose any information in the process. Okay, and we can also state this for the system of linear equations. This means we multiply the equation ax is equal to b by m from the left hand side. In other words, the new system now reads m times ax is equal to m times b. And now the idea is that this new system here is simpler in the sense that it is easier to see the solution set. So please remember this overall idea and recall that we already have seen this in the last video. There we had a system given by a matrix with entries 1, 3, 2, minus 1. And we changed the system by row operations such that the new matrix M times A is simpler. And simpler means that we have more zeros involved such that we can easily find the solution set. Indeed, what we want in the end is such a triangle structure of the corresponding matrix. More concretely, this means below the diagonal we only find zeros. Hence, the natural question here is, what is the matrix M in this situation? And indeed, we want to answer this question in a completely general context. And please recall, in the example, we got to our result here just by using row operations. Therefore, for a general matrix A, we just have to look at the rows. And as always, we will consider an M times N matrix, which means we have exactly M rows. And to make it a little bit simpler, let's give the rows a special name. Indeed, when we discussed the row picture of the matrix multiplication, we already introduced alphas for the rows. So we have alpha 1t, alpha 2t, until we reach alpha mt. Okay, and now what we want is that we can take one row and add another row to it. And also for this, the row picture for the matrix product can help us to describe it. Namely, we choose a vector ct that has only two non-vanishing entries. And now we simply call the one entry ci and the other one cj. Moreover, this should be a one times m vector. Because in this case, we can easily multiply it from the left to the matrix A. And what we get there is something similar to the column picture of the matrix vector product we have discussed in part 14. 
Indeed, we can say this is just the transpose version of it. This means the result we get here is a linear combination of the rows of A. However, since there are only two non-vanishing entries for C, we only get the sum of two rows here. So we have Ci times alpha it plus the same but now with the index j. In other words, now we have a procedure for adding rows by just using the matrix product. And now the overall idea would be to use such vector ct as the rows of the matrix m. Okay, in order to see this, let's first look at a simple example. So with simple I mean that the matrix A only has three rows, so M is equal to 3. However, please note the number of columns N is still arbitrary. Okay, and now from the left hand side here we can multiply a matrix, which is a square matrix, and it should be a 3 times 3 matrix. For example, we could choose the identity matrix, which does not change anything. Okay, but now let's say we want to change the third row here. More concretely, let's say we want to add the first row to the third row here. And moreover, this should happen with a scalar lambda. Hence, before we add the first row, we want to multiply it with a scalar lambda. So you should remember this from above. This is a typical row operation we want to do. Okay, but now we want to describe this with the matrix product, so we use such a vector ct. More precisely, this ct here we should find in the third row here, because we want to change the third row. And because we want to add the first row, our index i is 1, which means our lambda is found in the first column. And all the other entries need to have zeros. Of course, with the exception of the last one, of the third one, because there we don't want to change the third row at all. In summary, you see this 3 times 3 matrix here describes the row operation we want. And moreover, you should see it's an invertible matrix. This is easy to see, because we can immediately write down the inverse. We simply have to undo the row operation, which means we have to subtract the first row here. So the matrix looks exactly the same, but with a minus lambda here. Okay, very good. Now we have such a matrix, which describes our row operation we want. And indeed, we will get the matrix a name. The matrix is called Z. And in the index, I want to put in the corresponding rows. So the 3 will mean we change the third row. And then comes a plus and lambda 1 to say that we add the first row. So in other words, this symbolic index just tells you which operation is done. Okay, then we are ready to put this into a general definition. Now this means we just define all these Z matrices. Hence we have two indices involved, i and j. And the resulting matrix is an m times n matrix, so a square matrix. And please recall, m stands for the number of rows in our matrix A. And it's a square matrix because we want to multiply it from the left and we don't want to change the shape of the matrix A. Moreover, for the definition here, it's important that the two indices don't coincide, so i is not equal to j. And with that, we don't have a restriction for lambda at all, lambda can be any real number. And now we can define the matrix Z as before, by using the identity matrix as a base, where we put lambda at the i jth position. So you see, the definition is not complicated at all, and what we get is an invertible matrix. And this matrix describes the row operations for adding rows. So you already know, this is the most important row operation, but I also want to discuss two more. The next one will be about exchanging rows. So as before, let's look at a lower dimension example, so let's consider three rows again. Okay, and now let's describe how we can exchange the first row with the third row. So we exchange the two rows. You see, this can be very helpful if the order of the rows is not good for us. 
And now the question is, what matrix do we have to multiply from the left here? And as before, we can start with the identity matrix and recall what we have learned before. Indeed, we already know we have to put the zeros and the ones in a different order. And here it's easy to remember, we also just have to exchange the two corresponding rows to get the result. Because now the first row here gives us back alpha 3. The second row still gives back alpha 2 and the last row here gives back alpha 1. Hence, this is exactly what we want for exchanging two rows. And then we can also introduce a good name for this square matrix. Which, by the way, is also invertible. I use P for permutation and we use 1 and 3 in the index. Moreover, I want to use this arrow to denote that we exchange two rows. Okay, so you see, this is not complicated at all and we can also put that into a general definition as above. So we define the square matrix Pij as a permutation matrix. And at this point, you already know how the definition works. We start with the identity matrix as a base and then we say we just exchange two rows. And what we get is an invertible matrix which describes the row operations we call exchanging rows. Okay, and now we are almost finished with all the row operations we need. Only one is left and this is just scaling rows. And in fact, I would say this is the simplest one. Because there it just means that we want to multiply a whole row with a scalar lambda. Indeed, this is not so complicated because we can act in each row separately. So maybe we would say we want to multiply the first row with d1. And d1 is just a scalar, a real number. And then we can simply continue that until we reach dm. So maybe we have m different scalars here. And now you already know, also there we need a square matrix on the left hand side. And now it's not hard to see, this has to be a diagonal matrix with our scalars on the diagonal. Therefore, all the other entries here are given as zeros. However, you should see one restriction here immediately. All the entries on the diagonal have to be non-vanishing. Because otherwise, we would lose information in our operation. So you know, it needs to be reversible so we need to be able to divide by the scalar as well. In other words, with this condition here, we have an invertible matrix on the left. And with this, we finally have all the operations we would put into the term row operations. Hence, we can write this as a sloppy definition. Therefore, it means if we say row operations, we actually mean a finite combination of the matrices above. So we just multiply all these matrices from the left and then we know we can also reverse this manipulation. So in summary, we would say we don't lose information. And of course, the idea in the end would be that we don't have to define such a matrix M, we can just do all the row operations and know they don't change the result. They just should make it easier in the end that we can see the solution set of the system. And maybe this is a good endpoint for the video. Let's denote the important property of the row operations. So for any matrix A with m columns and n rows, we can multiply it with an invertible square matrix M from the left. So an M times n matrix. And please recall, this includes all the row operations. And then we have that the kernel does not change at all. In other words, the kernel of the matrix M times A is the same as the kernel of A. So this is very important, so you can remember, row operations don't change the kernel. However, they will change the range of the matrix. But they don't change it so much, we can still calculate the range with the original range just by multiplying with the matrix M. Now, if you have never seen this, the right hand side here denotes a set. Namely, it's the set of all elements of the form m times y. Where y comes from the set on the right hand side here. 
So in our case, y comes from the range of a. And indeed, by knowing this definition, it's not hard to prove the equality here. Moreover, it's also not hard to prove that the kernel does not change. However, I would say this is a good exercise for you. Try to write down the proof of this fact. Indeed, this is a fact we will use a lot in the next videos when we talk about the Gaussian elimination and the solution set of systems of linear equations. Therefore, I really hope that I see you there and have a nice day. Bye.